more and just press that and you can find the chat box. So everybody welcome. I, um, I'm here with Kathy Wrigley and Jack Horton. Uh, two of our team are absent tonight, but um, we are very excited about our special guest, Jeff Bottom. So let me get started. Um, we will have announcements of Plant of the Week, Mystery Bird, This Week in Central Florida Birding, and the program Florida Raptors with Jeff Bowden of Kawa Sporting Optics. And I'd like to mention that we have upcoming programs. Next week will be Wakawa Spring State Park with the Bird Chat team. Um, we'll feature different areas of the park, what you can see and what seasons and stuff. We've been doing uh, bird surveys at the park for uh, about two and a half years, I believe it is, um, in support of the park biologist uh, who does prescribed burning there and has, wants to document the changes in the bird life there since they did the prescribed burning. And on May 20th, it's our regular Orange Audubon monthly program. Uh, it's going to be 150 years of wildlife conservation history by Dr. Mark Madison, who's the historian at the um, Natural Resources um, Museum in Shepherdsville, West Virginia, the, the Museum of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So that one should be really interesting. And you don't have to use Zoom for that one. Just go to our YouTube channel at 7 o'clock on that Thursday, and it'll pop up. And then May 27th, we're gonna get ready for the June challenge with a program on summer birding and the June challenge, the bird chat team. Oops, just a second. I don't know where that went. Just a second. Okay. And we recently had our birdathon, and if you have not yet donated, you can donate and make an annotation that it's in honor of bird chat. If you want to support us, and there's a donate button on the right of the main homepage of Orange Audubon. So it's www.orangeaudubonfl.org. And Saturday, May eighth, is the Wakawa Spring State Park Bird Survey. That Kathy organizes and leads, and you contact her to register. Seven fifteen. And uh, May twenty second is the Oakland Nature Preserve Bird Survey that Kathy also organizes, and contact her to join that one. So that's a very interesting birding site, also, and so you might enjoy joining the other birders. And I'll do the plant of the week. So I picked the Peruvian primrose willow, Ludwigia peruviana, family on a gracie, because it's so common out on the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive and other wetlands that have invasive plants because it is an invasive. It's an EPSI, Exotic Pest Plant Council, category one. So it's a serious invasive overtaking wetlands. It's an obligate wetland plant uh, of DEP's category. And this is where it occurs. And just for your edification, I wanna compare it to the native angle stem primrose willow that's out on the wildlife drive. On the left, you can see the narrow leaves and the smaller flowers uh, compared to the um, Peruvian Primrose Willow. Okay. All right. On to Jack for the mystery bird. Can you hear us, Jack? Yeah. Hey, Pete. Can you speak again? Speak We're again. not hearing you too well. Um, so this should take instantly. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, yeah, I, I did get a message from my computer telling me my, my internet connection is unstable. So if you go to the next slide, please. 
And there's another photo of this guy. And oh, somebody's close, but but we we don't have a winner. Um, and then uh, the same yeah. What's that? Yeah, I was just saying, Terry. Terry says sandpiper. So you're on the right track. Yeah. Closing in. <laughs> Here we got a photo of one kind of stepping out as it's foraging for food. The feathers are gorgeous. It looks like a, a fall bird there, yeah. Taken in summer, probably late summer. Looks like a juve. Mm -hmm. Should I have to go one more and get on with it? Uh, we have a winner. Yay. Hey. Yeah, Kim got it. It's a least sandpiper. So uh, least sandpipers uh, feed on the, the upper edge of mudflats with low vegetation during migration. Uh, they use inland habitats more often than other small shorebirds. Um, these guys are long distance migrants. Um, by the way, I'm reading a book about uh, migration and the new, the new stuff that's coming out due to technology gains is just amazing about the migration and, and what they have uh, said that, no, no, it's not that anymore and now it's this, but uh, because of their more northerly wintering range, uh, they are more widespread in distribution during migration compared to other shorebirds. Um, and they, they kind of got two theories on this. One theory is that the, uh, the wide distribution during migration suggests that they, uh, while traversing North America, they have several feeding stops and are punctuated by a short or intermediate distance flights, which I believe they call hops and or skips, rather than long flights, which they call jumps between stopover sites. Another theory is that the later migrants may settle, may settle to a refuel uh, at a more northerly site than earlier arrivals and thus to spread out as they go. Um, all the photos you saw, I took at Laud within the past couple of weeks, yeah. right off of Lust in the mud flats and, and very close to my vehicle. Uh, I had to change my lens setting because it was so close. And so, yeah, that's our mystery bird, the least sandpiper. Great. Nice. Okay. And so this is our new weekly feature this week in Florida birding. Um, as we were talking before we started the chat with Jeff and migrations seem to be a bit slow this year in Florida. Maybe that's good for the birds. Maybe they had favorable winds and they got up to where they need to be quicker. But this is a migrant um, I saw last weekend at the Orlando wetlands. It was a nice surprise of seeing a bobolink very, very close by and being able to watch his feeding behavior. And it was really going to town on those grass seeds, um, all different kinds in the Biden's Alba. You can go to the next slide. Sorry. Next slide, yeah, okay. He was beautiful. And then, um, I've been near where I work, I've been checking out the um, some mud flats and had um, two spotted sandpipers and they're, they've been hanging out for at least a week. And it's wonderful to see them in their beautiful breeding plumage where they have the really the spots are really coming out very, very nicely. And then one more slide. And then uh, Lori Elijah was doing a bio blitz and she got to see this wonderful yellow billed cuckoo who actually they will be staying here through the summer, um, but so hard to spot. So that's this week in Florida birding. And if you ever wanna contribute, just um, just email us um, at the email that you'll see at the end of the, uh, end of the program and we'll feature you on this week in Florida birding. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Okay, now we'll turn it over to our guest speaker, Jeff Bouton. And I'll introduce him while he's pulling that up. Um, he's been into raptors since the 80s when he were um, volunteered at the Cape May Hawk Watch. So he's just been raptor aficionado. And um, he was a, a big supporter of the Florida Keys Hawk Watch, which he'll tell us about. And uh, something else I found interesting is that he had a column in Wild Bird Magazine 
about birding with his son uh, from about age four to quite a bit later. And so we all appreciate getting kids into birding. So I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. Thank you for coming. Yeah, it's been a it's been a whirlwind trip. I've been, I guess, a, a semi-professional birder of one sort or another. It seems my whole adult life, um, starting off as you know, sort of the uh, seasonal field biologist, binoculars for hire, um, to professional guiding, primarily up in Alaska and um, uh, parts of the Northwest, and uh, now for the last 16 years working as the birder and nature representative for optics manufacturers, most recently with COA um, here in North America. So that's been, you know, quite a challenge and it keeps, allows me to still be engaged with the community that I loved my whole life. At any rate, um, I started off a lot of this uh, binocular for hire stuff that I've done over the years um, has indeed been uh, with Raptors. That's where I started as a, a young teenage punk kid. Um, so tonight what I want to do is talk to you about Florida raptor identification. And in particular, um, you know, there's 20 species of raptor. I uh, figure we've got, you know, 40 minutes, give or take. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's 20 species. That would be about two minutes per species to cover all the variation in uh, plumage and age and sex uh, classes and things of that. So instead of doing that, what I'm going to concentrate on is selecting some of the most difficult identification challenges that we face uh, commonly here in Florida. And we'll tackle each of those more in depth and hope to give everyone um, some information that you can't find readily in the field guides uh, and some stuff that, uh, you know, you may find uh, interesting and useful, hopefully. Um, so with that, move on. I do have a short introductory section. I apologize, a bit of a commercial, but uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting. Um, one of the best ways that I've found over the years to um, get adept uh, and to hone raptor identification skills is basically to go where you can see lots of raptors. You know, repetition uh, begets practice. Practice makes perfect, as we know. And the best way to do that, of course, is to visit a hawk watch. Um, at a hawk watch, you have the advantage of seeing potentially in, in an hour or two what could amount to a year's worth of sightings of raptors. Um, so that's one of the big keys. But the other thing you'll notice when you see all these raptors together, you'll start to realize the huge variation in shape and wing profile and structure and things that can happen and how the birds will change the way they look based on the wind conditions and their behavior respectively. Um, these types of IDs that are regularly made by hawk watchers is more of a holistic style of birding. Um, and as opposed to keying in on one specific um, set of feathers or a specific field mark or two, now you're looking at comparative structural clues uh, and you're looking at, you know, comparative length of a tail compared to body length and things of this nature. That's holistic birding when you're considering uh, the subject in its whole, rather than, uh, you know, just one laser focused uh, piece of that, of that species. Um, the other thing that you get as an advantage is you get the advantage of your trained raptor professional um, as a canned um, mentor uh, and professor to tell you not only as they're counting what these birds are, they're passing and, and to a degree why, um, so you get the advantage of someone that knows, and that is indeed me as a teenage punk uh, conducting the official hawk watch in Cape May Bird Observatory in a year that I don't want to really discuss because then you'll start doing math. But at the time I was the youngest hawk watcher they'd ever had uh, at that point. Here in Florida, of course, the only um, fully operational season-wide hawk watch that occurs is the Florida Keys Hawk Watch. And uh, it's held in Marathon, just outside of Marathon in the Curry Hammock State Park. I'm not gonna get into too much here, um, simply because I think you're gonna have a real talk fully on the project coming up, which would be far better than what I can do. But 
um, in, in short, birds flying across a broad front across south, across the Florida Peninsula, hit the Keys and then will concentrate as they island hop on the way south, you know, and get uh, to points where you can see hundreds, if not thousands of birds on a given day. Uh, the Florida Keys Hawk Watch is infamous, world famous perhaps is better, um, for its uh, peregrine falcon flights. It is a, a literally a world-class spectacle. Uh, more peregrine falcons uh, are concentrated over the Florida Keys in October than anywhere else in the world. Um, and this is by an order of magnitude. Uh, so it's a world-renowned site right here in Florida. It's great to see. Um, the peregrines, of course, make it the uh, the peregrine falcon capital of the world. It's like I say, world record. It's fun, but arguably, it's the swallow-tailed kite's uh, flight. And there is a Mississippi kite in the middle of this, I realize. But just to tell the story, um, that could be arguably more important data scientifically. Uh, peregrines are monitored coming south from other spots. You know, they hit Cape May Bird Observatory, and then Kip to Peak, Virginia, and other spots uh, as they migrate south. Uh, albeit in far less concentrations than in the Florida Keys. But um, the swallow-tailed kites, of course, are only migrating through Florida. Uh, if you were lucky enough uh, to tune in to the excellent talk last year um, by ARCI's uh, Ken Meyer and um, Gina Kent, you may recall uh, they talked about their really, really wonderful research that they're doing um, on short-tailed hawks and swallow-tailed kites. I've been following that for years. And um, as you also may recall, they talked about how the swallow-tailed kites stage in early July um, in these massive, you know, pre-migratory staging areas in the thousands, thousands of individual kites that may occur in these sites. Um, every year, ARCI um, utilizes all of their resources to be able to um, put transmitters on a handful of these swallow-tailed kites. I think there might be 12, maybe up to 20 at a time. And we get some fascinating data you can get watch real time uh, in the migration. We know that a lot of the birds do leap off the Florida Peninsula, don't go through the, uh, the Florida Keys. However, um, the Florida Keys Hawk Watch typically starts in September and they've seen hundreds of swallow-tailed kites pass there. Uh, but we know from the data that ARCI and others have done and anecdotally that these birds pass uh, a lot earlier. So to get to my point, um, like I say, normally the Florida Keys Hawk Watch starts in September. This year for the first year in 2021, they want to add the whole month of August uh, to their um, season, which is gonna, again, that increases uh, their, their spend um, and the donations necessary by a third. I will tell you the biggest challenge is housing in the Keys for these folks. Uh, this is the 2020 counters, wonderful individuals, fantastic human beings, Luis Glace on the left side, Mariah Heinewich on the right. Um, they're out there every day in the sun uh, and you can't tell through the mask, but this is a smile they would greet you with, welcome you uh, and help you see every bird if you visited. Um, they're great individuals and hopefully they're going to be there again this year and hopefully with a little help. So this brings me to the punchline of this whole thing. Um, for the first time ever, not only is the Florida Keys Hawk Watch going to uh, expand their season, uh, but for the first time ever, they're reaching out to the public for donations. So that's the, the whole punchline uh, to help uh, with the uh, modest corporate donations and grants that they've gotten in the past. It's the first time they've ever asked the public for help. Uh, I will tell you there's no overhead. Every penny donated goes directly first to the rent and then to the embarrassingly small stipend that the counters get. Uh, their volunteer counters making at most about $10 a day, just enough to keep them from starving to death uh, when they stand outside every day for uh, three months. So if you'd be willing to spend $5, $10, $20, there's a new page and a new look to the Florida Keys Hawk Watch site. I'm a huge supporter, always have been. I'm not officially um, part of the team, uh, but I'd like to support them and let you know that they are looking for any support they can get to try and gain this valuable data, which will help to support uh, and be complementary to what ARCI is doing because this will be a publicly accessible data set that they can use as well and other researchers. So that's the pitch. Okay, 
apologies for the short commercial, but uh, it's a cause I believe in and I wanted to let folks know that that's out there. Um, let's talk about Raptor ID and jump right in with one of the most difficult groups of Raptor identification, the exhibitors. Um, it's not coincidence that uh, every one of these online forums, when you look at the, uh, the ID uh, challenge groups, you know, um, uh, the ABA has what's this bird on Facebook and, you know, Raptor ID and in every other post, it seems like, is this a Sharpshin or is this a Cooper's Hawk? Because it's an extremely difficult identification. So we'll start there. Back in the 1930s, um, Roger Tory Peterson, of course, rolled out his uh, amazingly um, uh, it was a guide that simplified birding and made it accessible to everyone through a series of these field marks. And the field marks were, of course, meant to be a shortcut to identification to make birding more accessible uh, to everybody. Unfortunately, in the case of some of the birds like Sharpshinned and Cooper's Hawk, there is just no single magic bullet that you can take a shortcut to easy identification. Um, and it, the, the, the square tail versus rounded tail thing will lead you to as many misidentifications as it will proper identifications. And that's why this is such a challenging group and why you see it all the time, because you have to consider a series of different field marks, group them together, uh, and then come to the best fit for identification using a, a series of characteristics. And that makes this more complex and more difficult. So that's why I want to start with the exhibitors. The exhibitors are the short winged long tailed true hawks. They're bird hunters, they're ambush hunters. Um, they will make a, a dash after their mostly avian prey um, in, in short bursts of speed. Uh, they have the short rounded wings and the longer tails to help them maneuver back and forth, weave through trees and things of that nature as they're chasing their prey. And we'll talk about some of the characteristics of all the exhibitors. Here in the Florida, we're actually lucky in that we only have two of the three uh, North American exhibitors to deal with. We only get Cooper's Hawk and Sharpshin, no Northern Goshawk. So we do have a little simpler case than some. Um, exhibitors, uh, these are juvenile Sharpshin hawks. There's a female on the right and a male on the left. One of the characteristics that can be useful is that they have this very pronounced uh, reverse sexual size dimorphism and that the females are up to a third larger in mass than the males and also longer and notably larger. Um, that helps in that if you think about it, you've got a little tiny male Sharpshin on the left then a, a larger female Sharpshin, then a slightly larger male Cooper's Hawk and a big chunky female Cooper's at the end of that scale. When you see a tiny male Sharpshin, it's so flitty and looks so small, very often you, you don't have as much challenge with that. You say, that looks like a Sharpshin to me. And conversely, on the other end of the scale, a big bruiser of a, of a Cooper's Hawk, you say, that's just way too big. That's gotta be a Cooper's Hawk. But the two in between are the ones that might be more challenging. So it's good to know about this sexual size dimorphism, and we'll get back to that in a second. Looking at the same sex um, uh, birds, these are uh, sharpshin hawks. We've got a juvenile on the right and an adult on the left. So if you compare the two, you see the juvenile has a brown back and a yellow iris uh, compared to a bluish gray back with a orangish red iris on the adult male. Those that are already adapting to the holistic method of birding, you may notice that tail looks short on the adult male. And you're absolutely right. Uh, exhibitors, like many raptor species, have longer flight feathers and longer tail feathers as juveniles. And basically, uh, you see the same in bald eagles. You may have noticed that juvenile bald eagles look very broad winged and adult bald eagles are, are comparatively very narrow winged and, and seem pointed winged. Um, it's almost like having training wheels on the juveniles, if you think about it in that way. These broader wings and longer tails allow them to stay aloft more effectively at the cost of maneuverability. And then once they've mastered the level of flight, they can then uh, more adeptly uh, transfer over to uh, you know, a, um, a smaller set of feathers, if you will. So you're absolutely right if you noted that. We switch those two birds around. We see a pattern that's very common throughout raptors moving from brown vertical streaking over here on the juvenile bird 
to horizontal barring. Um, and this is sort of a reddish orange barring on, on the exhibitors um, and moving from a yellow iris again to that reddish iris in the adult. Sharpshin hawks are named uh, for their tarsi or the tarsus here. Um, it's actually a kind of oddly shaped bone. Um, it's wider in the back and kind of triangular shaped and is indeed sharp uh, in the front. That's one of those things back in the early days of ornithology when they shot a bird to identify it, it's useful, but you'd never know that in the field if you weren't in banding or uh, had access to you know, injured birds perhaps. But indeed the sharp shin hawk does have little spindly legs um, compared to Cooper's hawks. And when you see a, a bird that is uh, perched on a branch, you can actually look at that as an ID characteristic, the little spindly middle toe of a sharp shin versus the thicker uh, legs on a Cooper's hawk. These are all banded and released uh, birds. So the other thing you'll note, uh, these are adult sharp shinned hawks. And we've got the female on the right and the male uh, on the left about to scale. Um, and you'll notice on top of the sexual size dimorphism, you'll also notice that the male is a deeper blue versus a more brownish gray coloration uh, on the adult female to the right. We'll get into why that's important in a little bit. Hopefully this will we'll tie this all together. Sharpshins in flight, we've got a few here. Um, Sharpshins are smaller headed. Uh, they have smaller rounded heads and they are sometimes described as looking buggy eyed because the eye fills more of the head. But in flight in particular, uh, it looks like you've got a little round head and you just stuck it to the body. Uh, they're very little neck projection. They, they seem to have almost no neck whatsoever uh, when flying. Um, they have the habit of typically in a typical glide posture of pushing the wrist here forward a little bit here again on the juvenile, um, which further accentuates the small headed look of a sharp shin in flight. Uh, juvenile sharp shins tend to be uniformly streaked all the way down and have a similar coloration on the underwings, which is important. We'll get to that in a little bit. But again, uh, here, if you were just looking uh, square tailed versus round tailed, this one you'd probably call a Sharpie. This one you'd probably call a sharp shin, but you'd be very tempted to call that a Cooper's Hawk and been wrong. So there's one out of three um, that doesn't work, sadly. We'll get into some other characteristics here in comparative photos. Uh, moving to a Cooper's Hawk. These are adult male coops. Uh, they're obviously a, a bulkier bird, uh, some different structural uh, cues, which we'll get to. And here we've got an adult male at right, adult female at left. You can see the, the adult male appears skinnier, um, but it looks long and lanky. Um, and comparatively, uh, in direct comparison to Sharpshins, Coopers have longer tails in comparison to their body and longer wings. So they do have a different structural look. Um, the adult female at left, she's just big and chunky, right? You know, uh, you can see she's a, a bigger bird. Um, the brown gray on this is not as, it's not a direct apples to apples comparison because they're not taken the same time of year. This female was taken in July and those feathers are about as old as they'd be. So it's, you know, browner and, and more faded and pale than it would be, but it's still, there's always a distinct color difference. If you ever get to watch a mated pair, you'll be able to easily identify, oh, that's the male, that's the female based on the, the color of the back color, particularly in the rump where it's most uh, blue gray. Um, again, here's an adult down here versus two juveniles up here. I talked about seasonal variation a little bit. Um, this is in fall, a juvenile Cooper's hawk, and in May, in spring migration, it looked more like this. You can see the feathers get all bleached out. Uh, those streaks get even thinner on the breast, um, but it follows the same pattern of brown vertical streaking on the breast here uh, being replaced with orangish barring. Um, on the adults. This is an adult male. Adult males will sometimes show a more grayish face. That's one of the characteristics also in that uh, color dimorphism between the, uh, the birds. But if you look at Cooper's hawks, they have a very blocky head, right? Unlike the rounded head of a Sharpie. Uh, it tends to be flat topped. They often fluff the hackles, even when not being held. You'll see this just even when they're perched. They always seem to have a more blocky square shaped head, flat topped um, above going with that yellow iris to the reddish iris. In flight, 
Uh, and again, this is sort of some all different types of flight pictures, not necessarily super crisp or anything. Uh, we've got some challenging ones as well to give it more of a, an idea. Uh, the Cooper's Hawk is sometimes referred to as the flying cross because in their typical soaring profile, they have a very straight leading edge to the wing. They always show a more pronounced head projection ahead of that wing because of the longer neck and the larger head. Um, this one has a very well pronounced rounded tail. Uh, but again, the adult down here could e easily look to be a square tail, right? So there again, it kind of fails us. Um, but generally straight leading edge, more pronounced head projection uh, is good. They are longer in the hand, if you will, from the wrist forward out to the wingtip uh, than a Sharpie, but that's a subjective difference that's going to take you a little while. One of the things that always holds true on juvenile coopers, and this works only on the juveniles, not the adults, is that the streaking is always most heavy here on the breast, um, giving way to uh, a more white belly below, and even the underwing coverts tend to be lighter than the heavily streaked area. So very often in distance, while a sharpshin, a juvenile sharpshin will have a sort of a uniform tone, uh, sort of a goldish brown color, um, Coopers will often look bibbed because of the fact that there is such a stark difference um, in the overall amount of streaking um, that you can see. So that's a, a good characteristic for uh, Cooper's Hawk versus Sharpshin. There is a gradation in the feather lengths. If you can see a view like this, this feather is clearly less long than this one and this one that leads to that rounded tail. Um, also, if you see a very pronounced white tip on the tail, that's something you're only going to see on a Cooper's Hawk if it's uh, a very broad white tip. And again, here's a juvenile male with a more squared off head, flat topped. Okay, so as we were talking about before, here's the difference in streaking. Sharpshin at right, Cooper's at left. You can see this blurry streaks going all the way down uh, versus especially in fall when they'll even have this, you know, buffy wash below the breast feathering uh, with heavy streaks up here and very sparse streaks as you move down onto the belly and below. As I said, that streaking difference isn't going to help you though on adult plumage. Um, so in adults, we have to look at other things. And one of the things that is uh, distinctly different beyond the head shape, the actual um, pattern of feathering, um, Cooper's hawks, the light area on the face tends to come back much further and actually sometimes connect uh, on the back on the hind neck, separating the darker cap from the lighter mantle. Um, so from an alliterative standpoint, if you think of the alliteration, think of Cooper's capped uh, can help a lot in helping you to remember um, that ID. Here's another view of that. Um, so you've got the capped Cooper's hawk on the top flat headed, it's got a dark cap, the light patch comes way back and connects on the back of the neck, separating that cap wholly from the lighter back feather. On uh, sharpshins, they tend to be more of a hooded look where that there's a, there's a bridge of color that connects the back to the top of the crown. This is an adult male over here with that smaller rounded head comes down the cap, connects to the back there with that light cheek not coming back as far and leaving that solid bridge of color connecting the cap in what we call the mantle or the back. This is the adult female here, same idea. So two sharpshins on the bottom, the Cooper's at top. In flight, again, uh, the typical profiles uh, with the wrist thrust forward here um, on a sharpshin, the streaking coming all the way down uh, compared to the straight leading edge and more hooded and bibbed look on a juvenile Cooper's Hawk, as an example, both uh, with their yellow irises. Okay, so that's exhibitors. Um, I think we'll move on uh, to some Budio challenges. And hopefully, you know, I know getting in kind of deep there, but hopefully you all picked up a few things uh, that will help you. Uh, sadly, okay. you know, what's that? Oh, sorry. Um, Moving on to the Budios here, uh, we'll look at uh, Broadwing Hawk as an example, as a starting point, as, as just a typical Budio. Uh, the Budios are the um, genus of the soaring hawks, right? These are your red tailed, uh, short tailed, um, uh, uh, 
broad winged and red shouldered hawk primarily here in Florida. We do get Swainsons in winter as well, but rarely. Um, of course, the most common of these is the bird that everybody knows. And the bird that you're gonna see most often uh, is the red shouldered hawk. So these are adult red shouldered hawks. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Uh, here in Florida, we get two subspecies. Um, in the northern part of Florida, the L and I race is more common. They're still paler than northern birds, but not as pale as the Extimus subspecies, which we get uh, more commonly in South Florida um, in the lower Everglades basin and into the Keys, which can be extremely gray headed and even more of a strawberry blonde look on the, on the breast here. Um, in a mated pair, there is sexual dimorphism in that the males are always lighter than the females they mate with, but red-shouldered hawks are named by this patch of red feathering that's mostly covered um, on the wing um, when closed. It goes from the wrist to the body, thus the red shoulder uh, that is seen in flight at the front edge of the wing, but more often you see them like this and you notice more than the red shoulder perhaps, this really distinct black and white checkering, the checkerboard look uh, on the back of, here's the these would be the, um, the greater coverts that are black with white barring on them. And then the secondaries here, which are black with white barring on them. And the primaries, black with these white tips. And the tail is black with those thin white bands through it. Okay. And then, on, of course, on the breast, we talked about in the adults, the reddish horizontal barring. So that's important to remember because when we go to the juveniles, the wing pattern on a juvenile actually mirrors quite effectively uh, the adults, but instead of being black and white and very contrasty and stark, it's browns and tans. But still, you can see the, the speckling up here on the coverts. You've got these light bands going through the secondaries there. Um, go back one, unlike excipiters, which go from a yellow eye to a blood red eye, all adult budios will have a chocolate brown iris, dark chocolate brown and they start lighter. Red-tailed hawks will start pure yellow like an excipiter, but um, the red shoulders and broad wings tend to be a little bit darker, but it can be from sort of a straw to a, a light brown going to dark brown. The streaking on the breast again is um, very brown and vertical. Uh, highly variable though, it, sometimes you can get birds that are more heavily streaked below, uh, but usually they have some on the chest, which are separated from a red-tailed hawk. But look at a broad-winged hawk in comparison. We can do subjective things like we did with Sharpshin and Coopers. You know, talk about the fact that it's bigger headed and has a stockier, shorter body and a comparatively shorter tail um, compared to it. But the nice thing comparing to the red shoulder of the side, there is a magic bullet and we could put a single field mark that we can look for on broad wing for identification and that they have solid secondaries. They lack all this speckling and the barring in particular on the secondaries and on the primaries. Um, so whenever you see that, you know you're looking at a red-shouldered hawk and not say a juvenile broadwing, which would in wintertime would be unusual and we see uh, a bit in migration coming through. Okay, red shoulders in flight are a lot more straightforward. Um, if you look, these three feathers here are very similar in length. So red shoulder has a very uniquely squared or blunt tipped um, wingtip compared to other birds. It looks as though it's been almost chopped off. Um, and that wingtip has a, a black end on it, right? And then also uh, going perpendicular to the wing is this light crescent window just inside of that black tip. Um, that's really distinctive on red shoulders, both juveniles or adults. On the adults, it would be the same, but you'd have more black and white checkering here, and this would be all reddish orange on the underparts. Um, the tail on a juvenile red shoulder is also different. If you get to see one perch, we can look at that in a little bit, but with broader and wider um, tail banding. So here again is broad wing versus red shoulder. Whoops, sorry. Jumped ahead. Um, and again, with that blunt tipped wing, with that crescent shaped area, broad, kind of evenly, uh, even with tail barring of light and dark. Um, broad wing has a different wing shape. It's of course smaller too. 
but it has in juveniles will have a big rectangular light panel rather than just that little slash or a lot more pointed winged uh, and the tail pattern is much different if you get to see one head on and you can't see the sides of the wing you can see the under tail uh, you can actually tell if it's a red shoulder versus a broad wing very often by this different tail pattern as well with the very thin dark bands at the top and one very thick subterminal band okay so broad wings in flight um, Pete Dunn, David Sibley, and Clay Sutton wrote the book Hawks in Flight. For those interested, it's a great read. Uh, it's less of a field guide than something that you read at home, and it talks about flight characteristics and wing shapes and things of that nature. It's a good supplement to a standard field guide. But they describe very adeptly um, the broad winged hawk wing shape as representing uh, a candle flame shape. And indeed, I went online and cut out a candle shame, the candle flame. Uh, and when I superimpose it over top of that wing, you can see how um, a, of a great description that is, you know, evenly curling from either side to this sort of pointed tip. And that's a very typical wing shape, which is useful on Broadwing because of the fact that they really don't have a lot of distinctive markings, especially as juveniles. Um, there's sort of this amorphous streaking that can kind of fall anywhere. Um, they don't have a strong patagial mark here, like a red tailed wood uh, at the front of the wing. Um, it's just sort of a pale underwing and, uh, you know, a bit of streaking below. Uh, but it's more the wing shape and the wing profile that you use to help with that. As I showed in the beginning, these are all broad winged hawks in this flight uh, shot showing how wing shape can change dramatically. On the left hand side here, I've got three soaring profiles of juveniles. Uh, over here, I've got two adult uh, birds in a soaring profile with the broad white band and the more pronounced black trailing edge with the white, thick white bands through the tail, unlike uh, a red shoulder, which would be mostly a black tail with thin white bands. But you'll notice when a bird goes into a glide profile, how that changes. When they're soaring, of course, they're spreading everything out because they want to get as much of that hot rising air to get lift as they possibly can. Um, but when they go from a soaring profile to more of a gliding profile or cut into um, cutting into a strong wind, as an example, they have to reduce the sail, if you will. And, you know, to use a sailing analogy, you're tacking into the wind, right? So they bring the wingtips, they draw the wingtips in closer to the body. And as they do that, the wrist gets thrust forward a little bit, as you can see, especially on this bird in a, in a more of a high, uh, hard glide angle, but this is a shallow glide, shallow glide, shallow glide. So it's important also to understand how a bird's structure and shape is going to change depending on the wind conditions and what they're doing, whether they're gliding or whether they're circling around in slow circles, that's what we call soaring, it's gonna, um, they're gonna have a much different shape. Uh, we already learned a lot about short-tailed hawks, so I'm not gonna dwell on this. Um, shorties are amazing birds found in Florida. I'm gonna skip to this one uh, they're most apt to be um, probably confused with a broad wing or anything else, but um, short tails are less short tailed than they are broad winged, uh, except broad winged hawk was already taken. They're actually much broader winged than the broad winged hawk, which is confusing, um, but it's this very thick back edge to the wing um, that gives the appearance of a shorter tail. Uh, rather than it actually being physically short. And again, you can see how broad the wing is on this flapping juvenile light bird down here. Um, dark morphs are a lot easier, but uh, a short-tailed hawk's always gonna have these very dark flight feathers, um, contrasting with pure white underwings. Um, they're very stark up in here. Um, even on an adult broadwing that has a light black tip around the wing, it's nowhere near as the full dark as this, they're gonna have a lot of uh, choppy barring and things up here, whereas a shorty is gonna be full stark. But moreover than any, um, you know, better than any markings difference, the thing that makes a short-tailed a short-tailed is the way it flies. It's got a very unique style. Its wingtips will curl up ever so slightly, but it has the ability with those very broad wings to just kind of stall and hang in one place um, 
on the on the air column, which none of the other birds can really do in the same way they do. Uh, other birds can wind hover where they will kind of cock up into the wind and flap against it. Looking straight down, moving on to uh, the Kites, I already talked about swallowtail kites, really kind of unmistakable, you know, that that large bird with the white underside and the forked tail and the uh, the black flight feathers. Um, but once in a while you get Mississippi kite mixed with them. There's one thing I'm going to say about kites because I'm really not going to dwell on them, but kites are kind of interesting. If you notice with this subadult Mississippi in the center, you look at the wing closest to the body and it's narrower here than it is out here. The thicker part of the wing, the thickest part of the wing is out by the wrist, um, which is true of every kite species. If you look at them, if you get them, um, uh, you know, from straight below like this, even snail kite uh, of the, the kites that we have here. And that's a good way to, to um, help to separate a kite from say a peregrine falcon, which the uh, uh, Mississippi kite would be most, most likely to be confused with. All right, I'm gonna move into some falcon stuff. Um, like I say, the occipiters are the, the biggest thing um, that I wanted to really talk about because that's the most, it's like I say, it's one of the biggest challenges in all of birding. Um, so we're gonna start now with kestrels. And yes, these are less great images than they are useful perhaps uh, in more field, if you will. Um, kestrels structurally of the falcons have the narrowest wings um, they have soft angles or more rounded, okay? Give you the feel of that. Um, more of a rounded wingtip, more rounded up here at the wrist. But also comparatively, they have the longest tail compared to the body. And I think it's probably accentuated by the thinner wings um, than the other falcons. They are also not strong flyers compared to the other two falcons that we see, uh, the Merlin and the Peregrine Falcon. So they tend to be batted around a lot. And in a wind column, they will, you'll see them shifting from side to side more. And, and they, they tend to meander in flight, if you will, um, more than say a Merlin. Merlins on the other hand are very angular. Um, they're very dark falcons. What you notice on them outside of their very direct flight and typically a uh, very quick speed you'll notice a completely dark falcon with really dark underwings, but it's thicker at the base of the wing back here, very angular, sharply uh, angled here with much more of a pointed look, uh, broader base here, but very dark below. If you get one going slow enough and in good light, you can actually make out that they have thin light bands through the tail, much like a, a red shouldered hawk, um, and they've got a white chin and otherwise appear completely dark. These aren't the best pictures for it. Here's some better images of Merlin. Probably could have skipped that slide entirely uh, to tell the story, but nonetheless, these are all different shots of Merlins. You can see a very starkly white uh, chin here in those thin light bands through the tail there, very angular. Um, Merlin, unlike uh, a Kestrel, they are shorter tail, perhaps the shortest tail by comparison. Let me go back one. Um, here and here, uh, compared to the wing width, um, but they're very direct flyers, very fast flyers generally. And in general, you're not gonna notice that they're meandering from side to side or, you know, kind of bouncing along in the, in the, the air column like a Kestrel. Next step up from a Merlin, we're gonna jump from Merlin to Peregrine Falcon. And Peregrines are obviously a completely different beast. Uh, superficially, they're close to Merlin in markings but in structure, completely different. Look at the massively broad base um, of the secondaries going all the way out to the wrist. And then from the wrist, how that wingtip curls out to a very long hand. You can see the wrist is way back here. They have one of the longest primary um, of any of our raptors. And that leads to their very powerful flight. They're the fastest flying bird um, as a result of the uh, huge muscular pectoral muscles here and the the shape of their wing is completely aerodynamic 
go back one, you can see it well on these two. These are two juvenile peregrines. Peregrines have that very broad mustachial, whereas it's kind of weak on a Merlin. That's um, very noticeable and the nice white cheek uh, on the inside of that. They do have the brown vertical streaking here and here as we saw with many other raptors and adult peregrines at least will change. They get the nice white breast, but then get black sort of uh, barring, grayish barring going across uh, in their adult plumage here. Um, peregrines at distance, the wingtips curl up like this when they're soaring at great distance. So they're much like short tails in that way. Um, and when they flap, it's very distinctive because the very long wing kind of trails behind. So when they have a, they, they bring their wings up, the wingtips curl back as they're starting to push down and those flexible, long, long, long primary feathers will curl. And you get this very distinctive curl um, coming down to the end below the body and then snapping together. Um, so they're, they're somewhat flexible given this very fluid look to a peregrine in flight. Hard to describe, easy to show. And hopefully uh, if folks are interested in, in coming down to the Florida Keys Hawk Watch, um, you can give us a shout. Uh, I'd be happy to help anyone with uh, any questions they may have on visitation or anything like that. And uh, when Rafael Galvez speaks to you, the director of Florida Keys Hawk Watch, he'll be more helpful. But here again, I don't know if this is as helpful or not, but these are silhouettes of the three species, Kestrel to left, Merlin in the center, and Peregrine. And sometimes when you remove uh, coloration and markings, it forces you to really look again at the structural clues uh, like we talked about. You can see the rounded angles and longer tail, the Kestrels at left, um, the more angular look of the Merlins at the center, uh, but not near the length and breadth of the wing of the Peregrines uh, on the right side. And when they go into a big stoop, sometimes I refer to these as flying anchors on the lower right side here um, when they stoop on prey. Crested caracara is probably the last bird I'll talk about tonight looking at the time here. Um, but as we talked about before, we've got a brownish bird with sort of smudgy vertical streaks here uh, on the lower breast as a juvenile. It's got that pinkish coloration to it in the blue bill. Uh, when it gets to adult plumage, that changes to more of a black barred section. Uh, the color on the bill and the, the sear in particular gets to be a bright orange um, and brown. They go from more brownish plumage here as juveniles to more blackish uh, on the belly and the back and the wing coverts um, as adults. All right, let's see here. I think uh, one more shot and you know, with Caracara in flight. They'll tend to have four points of white kind of on each end of the extremities, if you will, just inside the black, so the base of the tail and the under tail coverts. Um, just inside the wingtips, here's a big patch of white and then the, the big white um, head below the black crown coming to the black belly. Uh, they'll ride on bowed wings. I include this because believe it or not, uh, this is actually believed to be excuse me, a terrestrial falcon species, um, or was. Uh, maybe that's changed again genetically. We're always bouncing these things around, but that was um, thought to be closely related to the falcons, uh, even though structurally and behaviorally completely different. All right, I think I'll uh, stop the share there and see if there's any questions, uh, anyone Q&A, anything like that, that anyone may have. That was uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. And Kathy's going to field the questions. Everybody write your questions in the chat. I say there's a lot to talk about. Uh, I've been doing it a long time. And I know some of that was probably more than some of you wanted to ever think about um, on Raptor ID. But uh, hopefully you all learned something. If you can all take something away from this that you may be able to use uh, and don't remember all of it, but bits and pieces, that's all I can hope for is trying to disseminate some of the things that I've uh, stolen from others or just happened to uh, learn through hours and hours and hours of hawk watching, staring at the sky with binoculars. Uh, happily, I've retired from that now and I leave it to the younger folks like Luisa and Mariah, but still like to go visit <laughs> when I can. 
Did you have a Joanne? Jo Joanne is asking, where is the North Florida Hawk Watch? Gotcha. So there really isn't a, a fully manned North Florida Hawk Watch. Um, there was a group that was um, doing about two week windows for a while uh, in St. Augustine um, around that doesn't sound right. Um, St. Augustine, and I don't know where the official count is, but that's the only other site that um, was done in Florida. And part of the reason for that is, is there's just really not the proper set of, um, uh, of topographic uh, features to concentrate the birds. Generally up north, you know, coming down the Kittatinny ridges uh, through you know, Pennsylvania and, and areas, um, there's a lot of concentration. And then uh, some of the barrier islands and, and small peninsulas that funnel down to a sharp point like Cape May and Kiptipeak will have concentrations. But, you know, otherwise between, I think Virginia and, and the Florida Keys, I don't think there's a single hawk watch um, that's manned based on the fact that there's just not a real concentration point that anyone's can find. Okay, and um, Carl asks, are snail kite populations dropping? That's a good question I don't have the answer for. Um, they have certainly moved dramatically. We had some different weather conditions two winters ago uh, with higher water tables, I know, in South Florida than we typically have in the water. And it does seem like all of the local snail kites that I knew about are gone. They've gone elsewhere. Um, I've heard that there's more of a, a, a steady march northward in the state. And certainly we've seen that, you know, around Kissimmee uh, in years of late and, and you ladies might be able to feel that better than I, but maybe um, the thought was, I know that the, uh, that the introduced apple snails uh, populations are really changing the, the whole population dynamic of the snail kite um, and that, you know, they're, uh, they're, disappearing from the southern parts of the range and, and moving up into the peninsula. But that's just one theory. All right, Mark Hanen writes, um, he is an observer at the Detroit River Hawk Watch mm -hmm. and wondered if you had a chance to see large volumes of broad wings hawk pass. We've had 35K days in mid-September and he would love to visit the Keys program as he winters in Florida. I, I have seen some great broadwing flights. Uh, I've got to admit, in the years that I was hawk watching, I was usually tied to a specific site. And um, I always favored the coastal sites. I've been a big Falcon fan for a long time. But yeah, I've seen a handful of, of really good broadwing flights, none of the, the megas maybe, but I've definitely seen a 5K day. I mean, a five figure day um, in Texas. Uh, in particular, I've seen some some really good ones on the coast of Texas, um, mixing with Mississippi kites down there. So, but uh, the Florida Keys Hawk Watch is completely different than a lot of the other flights. And that broad wings aren't the bread and butter. We often see more peregrines down there than um, than broad wings, which is kind of funny. Uh, but it's a different experience, you know. And you're picking through frigate birds and fl flocks of anhingas, maybe <laughs> to see your birds, which is a little different, but. Let's see, Raphael said that you were right, there's Guana, um, Guana Tomalto Matanzas National Reserve. Perfect, thank you, sir. Yeah, um, and I, they haven't been active for the last few years. I don't really know um, what happened, if it's just, you know, it was a dedicated core of volunteers that just, you know, something changed or someone moved, you just don't know what, it, what happened, but they haven't recorded any data in a few years. And, and the data was primarily, um, uh, the falcons up there, peregrines as well, um, because being a coastal site. And Deborah's wondering, have you been to the River of Raptors in Veracruz? I have not. It's okay. it's a, a major bucket list thing. Uh, I've seen um, parts of the same flight uh, pushing through Panama, um, you know, where they also get massive flights, but I've never never made it to Veracruz yet. Uh, I was very, very close one time, but uh, it remains on the bucket list for now. 
and what species go through there too, sorry. Um, so Veracruz is massive numbers uh, of birds, but they're primarily broad wing, uh, some turkey vultures um, and swains and socks and Mississippi kites make up the bulk of it, but it's, it's hundreds of thousands to million raptors at times. And we're getting lots of comments on how much they enjoyed your presentation and your photographs, which were amazing. And I'm just trying to absorb it all myself. It's really helpful. Most and of the better ones were taken at the Florida Keys. <laughs> but yeah, thanks. Uh, I got a lot of old ones too that weren't so hot, but uh, um, you know, those birds in hand are dated back to 20 year old slides. So I can't take it for what it's worth, but it's been a long time since I've done that. And several people have asked, you know, like me, they want to go back and watch this and take notes. So it will be available on our YouTube channel in a few days, Orange Audubon's YouTube channel. Fantastic. Never yeah. would like to know about Cape May. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, well, you know, Cape May is a magical place. Um, for years, it was the ultimate go-to spot and still is to some degree in fall migration. It still does good in spring migration as well. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as regular predictable, um, the fallouts of birds is good. And the hawk flight is, is great there as well. Of course, um, when I was doing that back in the early eighties, uh, the peregrines were just starting to come back. And I remember I was thrilled. I had one, of, I, I forget, it was like 600 birds or something for the season, you know, <laughs> which was mind boggling at that point in time. Uh, it was the beginning of, of the recovery for that species, which I'm happy to see. And of course now um, you see so many more, you know, that's a, it, uh, it's had four times that number in a day in the Florida Keys, you know, now, so it's a different world, but uh, still a fantastic place to visit. I don't know if contact me specifically of uh, specific questions, but um the one thing that is notable, you know, and I remembered when I first got there as a young punk, you know, wet behind the ears kid, the old timers all saying, gosh, it's just not like it used to be. And I'm like, what are you talking about? This is the best flight of birds I've ever seen in my life anywhere. And sadly, you know, not even a decade later, I was saying the exact same thing. I was like, gosh, I remember every day we'd walk this loop around this field and have 22 species of warbler in, in an hour and a half, you know, passing in groups that you couldn't even see them all because they're just pounding by and it seemed like a fraction of that. And now, you know, well, lo and behold, it's not just old people grumbling about, you know, not seeing as many as they used to because maybe their eyes aren't as good. Um, the birds aren't there and we know it now uh, due to some of the recent uh, reports out of Cornell, how many songbirds, fewer songbirds we have, it's scary. And Mark commented that it's challenging to ID raptors at a mile out, stare at the sky all day, as well as count. Indeed. <laughs> and that's why I don't do it officially anymore. I just do it for recreationally and then 